Bible Church. It's good to be gathered together once again, though, again, by this uh, digital and virtual means. We are going to go into the go Word of God, and we are going to go into the part of our hymnal where we sing some of the great Christmas carols that you enjoy. I know that you will delight in singing along. Psalm 105 reads, Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him. Speak of all his wonders. What God has done, sending Jesus Christ to be born in Bethlehem, is truly a wonder. And the angels sang about it, and we are going to join with them in singing the praises of God for all of the deeds all of the wonders which he has accomplished that we might know his salvation. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask that your hand would be upon us as we meet in this way, and may hearts be encouraged and strengthened and blessed and built up. So be exalted in our praises, and as we look to your word, may we, O Lord, so be rooted and strengthened in every way. Receive honor and glory. This is our heart's desire. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We are going to first of all sing, O come all ye faithful. And I suspect though the words are going to be in front of you that you won't need them, do sing along with us.
our first scripture reading today will come out of Isaiah chapter 9, 1 to 7. Would you please turn with me in your Bibles there? But there will be no more gloom for her who was in anguish in earlier times. He treated the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali with contempt. But later on, he shall make it glorious by the way of the sea on the other side of the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine upon them. You shall multiply the nation. You shall increase their gladness. They will be glad in your presence as with gladness of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For you shall break the yoke of their burden and the staff on their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, as the battle of Midian. For every boot of the booted warrior in battle tumult and cloak rolled in blood will be for burning, fuel for the fire. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. This is the reading of the word of the Lord. Would you please join with us in singing our next hymn, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. second scripture reading for today will come out of Isaiah chapter 11 verses 1 to 5. Would you please turn with me there together? Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, 
the spirit of the knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord, and he will not judge by what his eyes see, nor make a decision by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breadth of his lips he will slay the wicked. Also, righteousness will be the belt about his loins, and faithfulness the belt about his waist. This is the reading of the word of the Lord. Would you please join me for our next hymn, The Birthday of a King. together to the Lord in prayer. Lord, how we thank you and praise you for your great goodness to us. And even as we began by saying out of Psalm 105, how that your great deeds, they are truly a wonder. As we come to this time of the year, we consider once again the wonder of your love for us and your great mercy in sending Jesus Christ to be born in Bethlehem. We praise you and we exalt you. Be exalted in our midst and be exalted over all the earth. We pray that those who to this point have held you off, Lord, may there be tender hearts and may they see what they have held off, what they have missed, what they have passed by so many times before. So work in hearts, we ask. We do give you thanks for your mercies of this past week and for all of your kindness to us. And we bring our needs before you and ask that you would show yourself ever so strong again. Hear us, Lord, in the requests that we bring. We pray for our Jerusalem round about us in the west end of Winnipeg. And we ask for Ashburn Street, praying that there, your love and that your light would shine so brightly into every heart and every home. Work, O oh God, we pray, and draw men and women to yourself. We pray for our mission partner, the Union Gospel Mission, asking for all of the leadership and staff, for all of the volunteers, for those who are a part of the men's or the women's program or the children's program. We ask that into every heart, and every life that is impacted, there would be such a work of your spirit to convict of sin and draw men and women to yourself. Bless abundantly, we ask and pray. For many needs that are round about us, hear us, Lord. 
We realize that many are grieving, many are struggling, many are despondent, many are discouraged, many are wondering what the future holds. May their eyes be set upon you, and may their confidence and trust be in you, and may they be bolstered, may they be strengthened in every way as they look to you, knowing that you do all things well and that you will watch over them in loving tenderness. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray for workers for the gospel harvest. We pray for those who are in authority. We pray for those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. We pray for your word to be sent forth all around the world, not just here, but all around the world, with a power of the Holy Ghost to convict of sin and to work righteousness in hearts. We pray for your coming that it would not be long. We pray that our hearts would be tender. We pray that we would not be stiff-necked or hard-hearted, but may we be tender before you, and may we receive your word with gladness and with eagerness. We pray, Lord, that this would be a day of your salvation, and we ask that as we open your word that it, in, it would indeed be open before us and that you would advance your work in our hearts right now. Hear us, Lord, and do all that is pleasing in your sight. For every need that is raised up before you here, every petition that is brought before you again, Lord, meet the needs and let it be that you would receive praise, honor, glory through it all. So may we be ever careful in this way that you would be praised in all that takes place. Hear us, Lord, and again, receive our thanks. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I ask that you Go with me to Romans chapter 1, and I'll be reading the first seven verses. Romans chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David, according to the flesh, who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake among whom you also are the called of God. To all the saints, to all who are beloved of God, rather, to all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The book of Romans has been called the fifth gospel. It is arranged differently than the, than the first Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Yet Paul here, who did not write a Gospel himself, although we suspect that Luke leaned heavily upon the instruction and the, what he learned from Paul in order that he might write his Gospel, the Gospel of Luke, Paul takes a different approach as he comes here to the book of Romans, and many see, don't see the same gospel presentation. But yet, I think that that word which is given, the fifth gospel account, is very appropriate. We do not have a full account of Bethlehem, such as Matthew and Luke give us, and we do not have the details of parables and of miracles such as all of the Gospels give us, or such as what each Gospel gives us in the lead-up to the week of Passion and to the crucifixion of our Lord and then his resurrection. But yet, Paul, in a thematic, 
in a topical manner, he brings us to the very same message of Christ and the centrality of the gospel. Romans is very different from the other letters which Paul wrote. The other letters were addressed to churches which Paul had himself either begun or churches which he had a vital impact in or people such as Philemon or Timothy or Titus who he had poured himself into. But Rome, Romans, is different because Paul had not yet been there. That is rather strange when you think that Paul himself was a Roman, but you did not have to be born physically or geographically in the city of Rome in order to bear a Roman citizenship. That was something that could be received from your parents or in other ways rather than being born within the parameters of the city of Rome. So here Paul, a Roman citizen, having never been to Rome itself, he is writing in advance of wanting to go there and he is eager to have the help of the believers there in the city of Rome as he is setting his sights upon Spain. He wants to carry the gospel where the word of the message of Christ has never yet been proclaimed. He has Spain in his eye. He is preached in what we now regard as Turkey and also in Greece. He has labored there and he has ministered and churches have been established. It's an exciting story that we read through the pages of the book of Acts. But now Paul, he is looking to new fields, places where people have not yet heard of Jesus Christ and of his power to save. The very same message and the very same power that came upon the apostle Paul when he was yet the man Saul and an emissary of the Sanhedrin making his way to Damascus. There on that road, he was stopped in his tracks and his life was changed. Paul knew that if he could be transformed by the power of the gospel, hard as his heart was against the gospel and against the person and the work of Jesus Christ and the cross, he knew that there was hope for each and every one. And he wanted to carry the message. He wanted it to go as far afield as he could possibly reach. Spain was in his heart. Spain was in his eye. But to pass by Rome and to receive the encouragement and the help one writer who I especially enjoyed reading about Rome, he said, actually, Romans is like a missionary appeal letter. It's the longest missionary appeal letter that perhaps was ever written. Most of them are one or two or three pages at most. Here we have Paul writing to the church in Rome, to the believers who had come to faith in Christ, through the ministry of others, but Paul is appealing to them and he is laying out the gospel of God and he is saying, this is what we rejoice in. This is what we delight in. And would you please help me as I take this very message to those over there to the west of you over in Spain who have not yet heard this glorious message of Jesus Christ. Now, Paul begins in the first seven verses, and there is reference here to Jesus coming to be born in Bethlehem. There are no shepherds. There are no magi or wise men. There is no account of the angels who came to Nazareth and spoke to Mary and to Joseph and say, look, this is of God. I know that you are rattled. I know that your whole world seems to be falling apart at what is taking place. But this is of God. God is at work. And you have the privilege of being a part of the very work of God. In these first seven verses, Paul is starting in, and I want you to consider this with me, 
Very often, we rush past the introductions to the letters of Paul and others as though, well, he's just sort of starting off, he's just sort of getting into what he wants to say, and the real meat comes later on. And this we just sort of bear with. Paul is identifying himself, he's identifying who he is addressing, and perhaps some introductory words of formality. No, no, here Paul is speaking vital words, and I think it's good for us to nourish our own hearts from them to receive the message which God has for us. Paul, he identifies himself as elsewhere as a bondservant of Christ Jesus. That, when before Paul was on the Damascus Road, that was the very last thing that Paul would have as the man Saul the last thing that he would have identified himself as or that he would ever want to identify himself as. But here, with joy, with gladness, he says, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus had bought him. Paul was a purchased man. A price had been paid on Calvary's cross. Paul knew it. A bondservant, one who has been purchased by Jesus Christ, called as an apostle set apart for the gospel of God. It was a high privilege which had been given to Paul that he would be called as an apostle, that is, as a sent one, one who was sent with a message. The message was so glorious, Paul, in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 14, he would say, God forbid that I should ever glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. There was nothing in this world. His heritage was amazing. His education was remarkable. There were connections which he had in this world, but he said, I am not going to glory in any of those things. I am going to glory only in the cross. And here, Paul, he says, I've been called as an apostle. That was not a heavy burden, and he was not here saying, oh, woe is me, I've been, I've been called and, and tasked with this burden. It was a high privilege. He says, set apart for the gospel of God. Again, it was something whereby he said, this is a privilege, this is an honor that has been given to me. It was the gospel of God which God promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. This was foreordained. Earlier in our message, or in our service, we've talked about uh, Isaiah chapters 9, chapters 11, and elsewhere it is spoken of how that this gospel would come. And it was foretold. It was not simply foretold, but it was foretold, and this is what Paul is referring to here. It was promised beforehand. It is written in the Holy Scriptures. Verse 3, concerning his son, Paul makes a beeline for Jesus Christ. Verse 1, verse 2, verse 3. Here, the beeline is away from himself and to Jesus. Paul is not wanting people to have their eyes set upon him. He is rather wanting people to see the glory and the splendor of his master, of Jesus Christ. Concerning his son, God's son, who was born of a descendant of David, according to the flesh. Here at the outset of Romans, the fifth gospel, here we have Jesus coming from the glories of heaven down such a precipitous fall, you might say, to Bethlehem, 
via Nazareth that he might be born, that he might be understood in worldly terms, earthly terms, to be the son of Mary and Joseph. Now, Joseph knew that Jesus was not his child, but yet he took upon himself the responsibility for raising this boy. And Mary knew that it was a wonder. The angel had come to her and said, Hail Mary! And so Mary understood also that this child was different from every, every child who had ever been born, that she had not bent the rules of morality, that God was indeed at work. But Concerning Jesus, concerning the Son of God, born of a descendant of David, Mary and Joseph there, both tracing their lineage back to the royal house of David. Verse 4, declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. In an, a blink of time, we are taken from Bethlehem and raced through the life of Jesus, approximately 33 years. We are raced through from the one end to the other. We are taken from Bethlehem to the empty tomb. You might say from a vacant womb to an empty and vacant tomb. Here we have Jesus who came to inhabit the womb of the virgin and then that tomb which, in which no man had ever been laid from the one to the other. And Jesus Christ is a wonder from whichever angle you look at him or from whether you start from the beginning or whether you look to the end, Jesus is indeed a wonder. Jesus declared the Son of God with power. With power. The resurrection was something which was so spectacular just as the incarnation that it was only God who could accomplish such things declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, this work of God has an impact upon our hearts and our lives. You can't say, well, so what? It's an interesting story. It's a beautiful story. The, the babe who was born in Bethlehem, and then it's, it's a story of tragedy, how that he was taken by rough hands and he was crucified, but how exciting it is that he comes alive from the dead, but it really has nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with us 2,000 years later. You see, Jesus Christ did not come to be born in Bethlehem because he was looking for an excursion. He did not come from heaven to this earth to check out things because he was bored and because he was looking for some type of a tourist experience. He came for your desperate need and the desperate need of my own heart. He became the son of Joseph, the son of Mary. He took upon himself flesh and blood in order that, as we have made our way through the book of Hebrews, in order that he might become the merciful and faithful high priest that we desperately needed in order to make the sacrifice which had never been made. All of the sacrifices in the Old Testament were pointing forward to what Christ would make. All of those imperfect, incomplete sacrifices, they were a foreshadowing of that one, one perfect sacrifice that Christ would make upon Calvary's cross Again, not because of his sin, but he was the sinless one 
dying in place of the sinful, the, those who were full of sin. So here we have Jesus Christ coming incarnate, the incarnation, God taking upon himself flesh and blood that he might be our faithful high priest, our merciful high priest, and that he might step forward to the very throne of God, to that true tabernacle in heaven, and that he might present his own perfect, pure, sinless blood for our atonement, and that he might be raised again from the dead in the resurrection. And what does it mean? It means that through this work which he has accomplished, not as God sitting in heaven, but as God coming in flesh to move among us, to live among us, to sense the desperate need of our hearts, that he might do what verse 5 says, he is the one through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake. Because Jesus Christ has come, he has provided salvation for us. He is the one who has extended grace to us and mercy and kindness. It is because of this that we have salvation and that we are called into his service, into apostleship, to take this message now to others. Paul says, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom all things are through our Lord Jesus Christ, and that is whom has, who has made us unbelievably wealthy in spiritual terms. Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake. Spain isn't mentioned here. You have to wait till the end of Romans. But even now, Paul is thinking of those Gentiles in Spain that he wants to hear the message of Jesus Christ and he is going to move directly in that point in order that they might hear and that those in Rome might link arms with him. And verse 6 says, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. Now, see what Paul is doing here. In verse 1, Paul has identified himself as one who has been called as an apostle. And then in verse 6, he says that these to whom he is writing are the called of Jesus Christ. Both of them have a calling upon their lives. Paul, he was a very unique individual, one who has written so much of the New Testament. Many of those people in Rome, they didn't probably write much at all, certainly nothing that is included within the pages of our scriptures, but yet God had a place and a purpose for them, each one having a call upon their life. Paul is saying that he was called as one who was to go and to proclaim, and he is reaching out to these people, just as I said, to link arms he is reaching out to them to say, help me. Help me in sending forth the gospel, not just to those who you live nearby there in Rome or other parts of the known world and the Roman Empire. Help me in order that we might fulfill the calling which is upon each of our lives and that we might praise God. Then verse 7 to all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints. Just this past week, I received a question from
from a Faith to Live By viewer who was asking, should we, as believers in Christ, refer to ourselves as sinners or saints? I'm going to answer that question very soon on the Bible has the answer, but here is how that I'm going to answer it. If we continue to refer to ourselves as sinners, we deprecate and we depreciate the work which Jesus Christ has done for us. Jesus said, it is finished. He was saying, I have bought men and women out of the slave market of sin in order that they might be the sons and daughters of God. If we say, well, no, actually, we're still sinners, we're still all messed up. Now, positionally, that may be uh, true, that we are still a long way to go, and until we get to heaven, there will be that struggle with sin. But when Jesus Christ comes, and the gavel comes down, and we are declared right with God, we are justified before the court of heaven. We do heaven and our Savior a horrible disservice. We, in fact, uh, discredit the work of Calvary if we go about and say, well, I'm just a sinner, just a sinner. We are called saints, here the Apostle Paul says. To all who are beloved of God in Rome, you have been given a new name, saints, that is, holy ones, and that is exactly who you are. And Paul says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, he has come that troubled hearts might know the peace of God he has come that grace might be extended, the grace that we could never have worked for or obtained by our own efforts, but the grace of God which reaches the last and the least, the lost wherever they are, the prodigals. The grace of God has come and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know this peace? You can know it today, and it can be a blessing in your heart. It can take root. It can do its marvelous work. It all starts when we see in Bethlehem not just a little baby born in a strange place where you wouldn't expect a baby to be born. You would expect more antiseptic surroundings and a little bit more compassion by the innkeeper, but see rather the Son of God who has come, humbling himself that we might be lifted up. Jesus Christ came from the glories of heaven to dwell in this earth in order that the sons of earth who knew nothing but the grime and the dirt of sin and of this world, that we might be lifted up and that we might be, that we might receive a new name, and that name is saints. Having received the grace of God, having taken hold of it, having been cleansed by the power of God, having been raised up by the power of the resurrection, we have this privilege in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I invite you to rejoice in that today. Lord, we give you thanks and praise for the privilege of hearing from your word and of being strengthened by it. Lord, may we, through this time, understand the greatness of your work and may we ever more rejoice in it and that it has direct impact upon our lives and our hearts. Called as saints, may we rejoice in that evermore, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm asking you to join with me now as we sing together, Go, 
tell it on the mountain. Set of our service, we did not take time for announcements, but let me highlight this one announcement. Each Sunday, we have continued to be posting on YouTube these church services, and we will continue to do that as long as is needed. But on December the 24th, as we are unable to gather in person for our typical candlelight service, which is such a highlight of the entire year, we are going to post that evening, December the 24th, starting at 7 o'clock, we are going to post a candlelight service, and I know that you will enjoy being a part of the typical service that we enjoy in person, readings, and many of the carols that you will want to sing along together as well as a meditation. So do be anticipating that once again, December the 24th at seven o'clock. And now the benediction, and I take it from Romans chapter 15 and verse 13. Now, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.